this computer. That's how I do. Uh, number two is make you. I uh, know I, I need to change the sharing scene. So to start sharing my screen. So you can see the blue screen. And then number three. Yes, sir. To make you the. Uh, make you the. Uh, so now you have control here. Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Blue screen, sir. Okay, that's good. So now, just Okay. All right. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of uh, Thoracic Gurus. And uh, the bottom line is, again, we are going to continue from where we left off uh, last week. We did two lectures last week. Uh, in the first lecture on, the, on Saturday or Sunday, I did all the cardiac graphs and I tried to cover cardiac cycle. And then I got a feedback that uh, a lot of people did, were struggling with the details of the cardiac cycle. So during the week, I did a second lecture. Uh, to redo the cardiac cycle and anybody who wants to uh, listen to the second lecture because it was not relayed on the IX platform uh, you can actually go on to the YouTube uh, thoracic gurus and it has been uploaded to that uh, platform so the cardiac cycle now is uh, a standalone lecture separately available on thoracic gurus and you will find it very easily and so because we did all the tracings and all uh, in great detail uh, last week uh, my suggestion is that today we should just look at intraaortic balloon pump uh, because the aortic tracings are the same as you get with the uh, intraaortic balloon pump. So this is a good time for us to understand the intraaortic balloon pump because we've just done the cardiac cycle. So we'll do first half, we'll do the intraaortic balloon pump. And then the second half of the lecture, uh, we will finish our ECGs because yesterday we finished the rhythm and we have not done conduction defects and we have not done MIs and things like that. So I think we need to practice the ECTs as well. So we will do that. And there is a whole lot of thoracic tracings, uh, which, is a, which is there in this lecture. I've prepared it all, but my suggestion is we'll do that as a separate lecture on another day. Uh, the thoracic tracings are all the pulmonary, the lung functions, the PFTs, uh, all of the balloon uh, pressure changes within the lung, pressure changes within the pleura and things like that. They are very important to learn. Uh, we have taught them in the past, but it will be a good uh, exercise for us to repeat that. Now, the other thing that I, I really want everybody to understand is that this uh, lecture is always designed as a one-to-one -one interactive lecture. So if you haven't got a pen and paper, this lecture is completely useless. So please uh, sit with pen and paper. Uh, remember your 200 page notebook. Uh, please draw whatever I ask you to draw in the 200 page notebook so that we can then correlate uh, our findings with this. So before I start any graphs on IAPP, I'll just talk a little bit about the IAPP. Now my first question to everybody is, can you draw the IAPP? Just draw the anatomy of an IAPP, which means starting from the monitor go backwards all the way up to the tip of the balloon pump so i want you to draw all the various parts of a balloon pump it's very important to understand how the balloon pump is constructed so i'm going to give you one minute uh, to draw it's going to be a rough drawing uh, but just tell me what are the various parts of a balloon pump and then i'll show you and i'll discuss it all in in, in a minute so quickly draw it uh, just the various balloons. And when you're finished, just tell me, yes, sir, we are ready. Start with the helium cylinder and work your way up all the way to the tip of the balloon pump. I, I want you to draw it. That's the only way to learn this, okay? Let me know when you're ready. Mm -hmm. 
ready or not it doesn't have to be an artist representation just a very quick diagram Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So this is what the balloon pump looks like. If ever in the exam you're asked to draw, which sometimes we do on, an, on a viva table. So you must uh, draw the various parts of the balloon pump and start from the uh, helium uh, thing. The helium thing is connected to the monitor. This is the monitor, the whole machine, okay? So this is just a representation of the machine. And the machine is connected by this to the, uh, to the distal end of the balloon pump. This is the distal end, that's the proximal end. At the distal end, you will have two outlets. One is, of course, for pressure tracing and for helium to go in. And the second, second uh, one is for the helium to go in, and the second one is for uh, the pressure tracing. So this transducer gives you the pressure tracing. Okay. Uh, you do have uh, a sheet here. So there is always a sheet so that you can push and pull the balloon. Uh, even after you've inserted it, if the position is not accurate or you're not happy, uh, with the positioning of the balloon pump, there is always a sterile sheet. So this sterile sheet has to be shown. Uh, this fixation thing is there to fix the balloon pump into one place once you are happy with the position. Inside there is the inside challenge. This is the lumen of the balloon pump. And on the outside of it is the, is the 30 to uh, 60 ml balloon. Okay, So there is an internal catheter and there is an, a balloon at the tip of the catheter. At the tip of the balloon pump is always a radio opaque tip. And uh, can somebody tell me why you have a radio opaque tip at the tip? Just quickly tell you me. Know, why you have upper end positions should be below. Position. The That's correct. You need to be able to see it on an X ray to know the position of the balloon pump. It's very, very, very important. Okay. And if you do a transection of the thing, then this is how it is. So this is the helium lumen of the thing. This is the blood lumen. There is always another uh, thing in there for blood lumen because all the tracings will come via the blood lumen. So this is the, and the French can be, it is different sizes now, it is available uh, on, depending on uh, what you are putting in, the sizes can go up or down. So it doesn't uh, matter the size really. It's, it has to be appropriate for that patient, okay? So this is how you put in the balloon pump, okay? This is where the balloon pump stays and it comes to the left of the left subclavian artery. Always the tip has to be, the tip is very, very important that the tip must be beyond the left, sub, uh, before the left subclavian artery, because you're coming retrograde, okay? It's coming retrograde. So the tip should not cross the left subclavian artery, okay? So now my question to you is, uh, and everybody, one by one, you can take the question, how do you confirm the presence of a balloon pump? How do you confirm that the distance is correct? Uh, whoever is there, uh, because just ask people, I can't see who's there. Who wants to ask? Uh, because you want to take it, if you want to tell us, or, or anybody can take it. Fitun can take it. Let Fitun take it. Fitun, do you know how you confirm the tip of the balloon pump? Uh, sir, we have to check it with TE. That would be the best. With what? Uh, transesophageal. Okay. Trans yeah, okay. So that's one way. What else? What are the other ways yeah. you can do it? Chest x-ray. You can do by chest x-ray as well. Very good. Excellent. What else? Uh, Transthoracic echocardiography might also give you an. Yeah, okay, difficult, but yeah, yeah, possible. Yeah. What else? Um, I don't know if you can do it blindly just by measuring, but that would not be an ideal idea. Yeah, yeah, but that, that is the starting point. When you insert it, you actually do make measurements uh, of the chest wall. So start off always with a physical measure, and then you confirm by uh, by investigation. So yeah. What else? One more thing I, I'm looking for. You said chest mm -hmm. x-ray, but there is another thing that you can use. Arterial tracing, sir. Uh, yes, arterial tracing, but uh, uh, we're talking about investigative. Left, head, uh, left radial uh, pulsations? Uh, yeah. More than that, fluoroscopic screening. Okay, so while you are there, you can on table, uh, while you're inserting, you can have a fluoroscopic screening. So let's go through all the things, okay? So measurement is the first thing. When you start, you always measure and you measure from the insertion point to the umbilicus because that's the angle. And then you measure the distance from the umbilicus to the sternal angle. So that is a standard uh, measurement in a patient when you want to measure the distance on a balloon pump. And there is always uh, markings on the balloon pump which will tell you exactly 
how much distance you have gone into the chest from the femoral point of insertion. The other one is the fluoroscopic guided insertion. So while you are inserting or after inserting on an ICU bed, it might be difficult to get a chest x-ray. And if you have a C-arm fluoroscopy there, you can just uh, do that because these are sick patients. And the last thing you want to do is lift the patient and put a, a x-ray plate behind the patient. So if you have a C-arm, then you can do that. Uh, of course, you can use a TOE. TOE is extremely good, uh, very, very sensitive. Probably one of the most sensitive uh, things that will tell you that the tip, and it should lie about two centimeters distant to the origin of the left subclavian artery. Can somebody tell me why should it lie two centimeters distant? What's the problem if it comes ahead? Quickly, quickly, come on, quickly. Somebody to come obstruction, in. To obstruct the flow to the... Yeah, absolutely. So if okay. it comes uh, to proximal, it can obstruct the flow and you can get ischemia, okay? And you can get vertebral ischemia, you can get spinal ischemia, you can get cerebral ischemia. So it's very important to make sure that the positioning is very accurate. The chest X-ray is also a good thing. And on a chest X-ray, you look at the level of the left main bronchus, okay? So the tip, you try to place it such that it is at the level of the left main bronchus, or it should be somewhere around the second or the third intercostal space. Sometimes they give you a chest X-ray and they ask you to identify the tip of the uh, of the uh, IABP, and and they will ask you the question: How you know is it is it well placed or is it not well placed? Now on a chest X-ray you don't know, so you have to use these two markings. You have to lose, either say it should be at the level of the left main bronchus, or it should be somewhere between the second and third intercostal space. Okay. Then uh, pressure transducing, somebody said that. So pressure trans transducing will actually tell you that it is, it is an arterial position and the position uh, you're getting a good trace means you're in a good position. Uh, and uh, sometimes it is, it's not a good idea, but uh, you can actually retract, uh, you can over push it. So get further into the, into the iota and then retract back to see uh, what is happening with the left subclavian. So you feel the left uh, radial artery pulse. And uh, you know you'll get obliteration of the radial artery pulse, and then when you push back, uh, the pulse will reappear. But that's not a good technique because that is actually that will cause uh, problems. So that's not a good technique, but it is something that is described uh, in the books. Now, the, so this concept, this picture I have bought in, slightly blurry picture, but it's a very important picture to understand the benefits of an IAB. So first and foremost is, is that this is normal flow. This is systole, okay? The first picture is systole. The second picture is diastole. So in systole, the balloon is deflated, okay? So normal pressures are going. So when the heart contracts, there is the blood coming out, blood going here and there. The, we know that the most of the uh, coronary uh, blood flow happens in diastole. We drew the cardiac cycle and we drew the coronary. Uh, the blood flows in the coronary, and we know most of the coronary blood flow happens in the di in diastole. So when you inflate the balloon in diastole, okay, it has to be timed in such a way that the balloon inflates in diastole. So when you inflate the balloon in diastole, what it does is this column of blood which is there gets pushed back. There is an increased pressure here, and it pushes this column of blood backwards. So there is increased cerebral flow so the left subclavian the carotids will have increased flow and more importantly this pressure will then increase the flow in the coronaries so that's the first advantage so in diastole you get increased coronary flow because the balloon comes into the action and the other important thing is not just that the other important thing is now because you have emptied this whole iota in diastole the pressure in the iota has gone down because the blood has now flown out. So when you come back to systole and you drop the balloon down, the moment you drop the balloon down, the pressure in the iota is less. So the myocardium has to make less effort to contract and eject the same amount of blood into the iota. Do you understand? So there are two benefits. One is the diastolic benefit where you get diastolic augmentation of blood flow to the coronaries and the cerebral circulation. But more importantly, there is a reduction in the vascular resistance as a result of which 
the myocardium in systole has to work less to push the blood and open the aortic valve and cause forward flow. So did you understand that? So there are two benefits, not just one benefit. And that is why in the exam, whenever they say you must talk about both the benefits, not just about diastolic augmentation, but it's also a systolic benefit. So the balloon inflates in diastole. It displaces the aortic blood both into the systemic circulation and the coronary circulation. So below the balloon, it pushes the blood down into the renals and the and the uh, rest of the body. But in front of the balloon, it pushes it back into the cerebral circulation and into the coronary. So both benefits, before the balloon, after the balloon. The balloon deflates before systole. So as soon as the balloon deflates, the pressure in the aorta goes down. That is an important understanding. When there is the, so there is reduced aortic pressure at systole. So diastolic augmentation thus improves blood flow, but more importantly, systolic augmentation, meaning it's more like reduction of the pressure, actually decreases the afterload. So the pressure, the, the SVR goes down because that column of blood is now gone into the circulation. So the LV workload goes down. This is important concept to understand. So there is a reduction in the, in the work of the myocardium as a result of which the myocardial oxygen consumption goes down. Okay, so it takes less effort for the heart to work. So this is a sick heart. The heart is struggling. And because of that, because of the sick heart, uh, you want to reduce the oxy oxygen consumption of that muscle. So you reduce that systolic pressure. And so it reduces the mean left ventricular ejection uh, pressure and decreases the duration of the isovolumetric contraction. Remember the isovolumetric contraction duration completely depends on the equalization of the ventricular and the uh, aortic pressure. Remember the uh, aortic valve is closed, the isovolumetric contraction happens, the pressure in the ventricle has to overcome the pressure in the aorta to open the aortic valve. But because that balloon pump is reducing the pressure in the aorta, so the isovolumetric contraction does not continue for a longer. It shortens the isovolumetric contraction. And because it shortens the isovolumetric contraction, the myocardial oxygen consumption goes down. So for the same amount of ejection fraction, the heart has to work less. Is this concept clear? Have you understood these two benefits? In fact, three benefits. Yes or no? So the second point in this slide, decreasing the mean LV ejection pressure, that I Yeah, know. yeah, because, because the LV has to overcome aortic pressure in a cardiac cycle. In an isovolumetric contraction, yeah, okay, 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 then, yes, the LV I has know. to overcome the aortic pressure for the aortic valve to open. But if the aortic pressure has gone down, the mean left ventricular ejection pressure does not have to be so high to overcome the uh, aortic pressure. You understand? Yes, understood. So it actually yeah, understood. reduces the left ventricular ejection pressure to create the same amount of ejection fraction. So you are not reducing the ejection fraction. You are reducing the work that is needed to do on the myocardium to open the aortic valve. Okay? All right. So let's quickly go through indications now. Anybody wants to tell me three or four indications for a balloon pump? Quickly. Is it making sense this way of teaching? Is it okay? Everybody's understanding? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, so somebody sir. come in and give me three or four indications. Uh, sir, acute MI that is not being resolved by the drugs. Okay. Uh, then it could be a failing heart, uh, low ejection fraction with the uh, acute MR. Uh, then uh, it could be a VHD, a post, uh, MI, uh, post MI VHD, just to stabilize the bridge the patient up to surgery. Okay. So let me now go through in a systematic way. You're right. You're absolutely right. But let's go through the thing in a systematic way. So first one is no choice but pump. You, you have to use a balloon pump because the heart is not 
is not working. The first and foremost in that is failure to come of bypass. Okay, that's the first one. So whenever you start talking about IABTs, you should say first is no choice but pump. So when you're operating in theater and you want to get the patient of bypass and the myocardium is so badly damaged that you cannot come of bypass, then you put in the balloon pump to reduce the oxygen consumption, the myocardial oxygen consumption, to reduce the systolic pressure so that the heart beats a bit better. So first point always in an indication is failure to come of bypass, okay? The second one is in severe ischemic mitral regurgitation. Again, in ischemic mitral regurgitation, it's a failing heart, okay? And we'll talk about this when uh, Vikas does the talk on uh, mitral regurgitation. The third point is in a ventricular septal defect, okay? But in both of these, ischemic mitral regurg and in a VSD, it works best when you are in hemodynamic compromise and you're waiting for repair. Okay, these are the sickest patients. And so these are the ones where you want to put in a balloon before you take them to theater. So that's the first one, no choice, but pump. The second indication is probably harmless, but probably not useful, high risk CABG. The, the, the evidence for all of this is, is starting to accumulate more and more, okay? So now forget the first line, but just you can use this in the exam. So in a high risk CABG, as a preoperative measure, you can use balloon pumps. In a high-risk PCI, as a preoperative measure, to help the myocardium before the procedure, you can use a balloon pump. In a cardiogenic shock while waiting for P PCI, and in pulmonary edema, in spite of maximal medical management, you can use a balloon pump. Again, this is a failing heart that you're trying to help, okay? Uh, prophylactic use, you need any two of the following in CABG. One is a left main stenosis more than 70% or a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%, unstable angina perioperatively and sometimes in a redo CABG, okay? You might have to use IABP as a prophylactic measure to support the myocardium and get him through the procedure. Uh, the other indications, some of them are experimental, are Tokotsubu cardiomyopathy, neurogenic cardiomyopathy of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and in severe aortic stenosis. Now, don't ask me details of these things. I have not read them. So this is uh, straight from the exam question and answer, but I don't know the details of Tokotsubu cardiomyopathy. I really don't understand the phenomenon. But you, if you want, you can read it. So what are the contraindications for an IABP? One is an absolute contraindication. One is aortic regurgitation. Uh, obviously, because if in an aortic regurgitation, if you use IBP, you will make the regurgs from a moderate regurg to a severe regurg, okay? Because you are increasing the back pressure across the aortic valve. The second thing is in the presence of aortic aneurysm, always not a good idea to insert a device into, into an aneurysm. You might predispose a rupture of the aneurysm. Third situation is in aortic dissection. Again, you don't know whether you're going to get into the true lumen or the false lumen of the aorta. So always a worry uh, to put in the balloon pumps into aortic dissection. In fact, you'll never uh, manage to get into the correct plane. Uh, in the presence of severe sepsis, uh, you do not want to use a, a IABP because in the presence of severe sepsis, uh, you want to... Uh, sorry, just let me clear all these drawings, whoever is drawing. Okay, so in the presence of severe sepsis, the last thing you want to put into uh, the patient's body is a foreign foreign material. Uh, so that will actually make situation worse. Uh, and then of course, last but not the least, uncontrolled coagulopathy. So if the patient is not controlled, uh, coagulopathy is not controlled, he can bleed to death from the, from the insertion process because it is an invasive procedure. You are, you are puncturing the femoral artery and you are putting in a catheter across into the femoral artery. So it is an invasive procedure. So coagulation and coagulopathy has to be controlled, okay? Now, relative contraindications for IABP are uh, um, atherosclerosis and arterial tortuosity because you've got to get through the femoral artery. So, and if you've got atherosclerosis and difficult, uh, uh, difficult um, access, then you will not be able to uh, put in the uh, balloon pump. A uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is a relative contraindication. Uh, it does increase the 
uh, problems in, in the patients. Uh, contraindication to anticoagulation is also considered as a relative contraindication to IABP. The common complications of IABP are mild limb ischemia, a balloon leak, limb leak a major limb ischemia, hemorrhage, and leg amputation due to ischemia. So the main complication is ischemia. That's the main thing that you're worried about. Uh, <clears throat> the other rarer complications are atheromatous cholesterol emboli, aortic or arterial dissection, cerebrovascular accident, thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, because you're inflating and closing the balloon within the circulation. So you may actually cause hemolysis of the RBCs and cause the subsequent problems with the balloon pump or helium embolism. If the balloon ruptures and you continue to blow in <coughs> helium into the system, you might get actually helium uh, embolism. Uh, these few slides I put in for completion sake so that people uh, who are going for exams know the answers to the commonly asked question on IAB. So now my question to you is please draw me a normal aortic cycle on the basis of the cardiac cycle. Draw me three cycles, okay? So one, two, and three. And then in the middle cycle, I want you to show me the deployment of a intra-aortic balloon pump. How will it look? Show me the tracings. So show me an aortic notch with a systole, diastole. Don't forget the dichrotic notch. I want to see the dichrotic notch and then return back to normal. So the seven phases that we spoke about in a cardiac cycle. So the first graph that you draw will be a normal aortic tracing. The second one will be a augmentation. And the third one will be a normal aortic tracing because there are some important points of differentiation in each one of them. So please draw a normal IABP tracing. Are you guys done? Yes. Okay. Have you marked the various parts? I want you to mark the various parts as well. So make sure that there is always an X axis and a Y axis. And once you finish the tracing, below that, on a second tracing, draw me the pressure of the balloon pump. Show me a tracing which shows that the balloon pump is in inflating and deflating. I want you to correlate that with your tracing of the IABP. And I'll show you in a minute the tracing. Done? I want you to show me the tracing of the balloon pump. What is happening to that balloon? How is it increasing and decreasing? Yes. Okay, so let me just continue. So this is the normal tracing, okay? So now look carefully at this. The first thing, this is important to understand this tracing, okay? So the first thing is the x-axis. X-axis is time, all right? And y-axis is pressure. So if you put x-axis and y-axis, I'm happy. You, you have to put time versus pressure. So this is your normal aortic, okay? Systole, diastole, dichrotic notch, systole, dichrotic notch, and then continuing into diastole. The diastole starts somewhere here, okay? Agreed? So this is systole, and then the di dichrotic notch, the closure of the aortic uh, valve causes the dichrotic notch. So there's a pushback, a slight increase in the pressure. That is the start of diastole, and then it traces down, and then the pressure gradually comes down. Isovolumetric relaxation, okay? So same volume and isovolumetric relaxation. And then what you have to do, a normal aortic uh, balloon pump, what it does is look at the blue tracing. As soon as you come to the diachrotic notch, that means as soon as the, balloon, as the aortic valve has closed, you inflate the balloon. So the balloon goes, book, the helium pushes into the balloon and you always overinflate it. It's always an overinflation. So it goes in and you get this overinflated spike and then you 
reduce it to get a plateau phase. And then the deflation happens just as you are reaching the assisted peak. Okay, so here is the deflation, and always the deflation is an over deflation before you reach the mean thing. So here is your balloon pump, here is your aortic tracing. You're coming to the end of systole at the ejection, at the diachronic notch, the balloon pump inflates and you get augmented of the press, augmentation of the pressure in diastole. This is important, okay? So this is diastolic augmentation. So that is the first benefit, is that there is augmentation of pressure in the diastole. The augmentation of the pressure in the diastole and deflation of the balloon brings about reduction of the uh, end, end aortic pressure, end systolic aortic pressure. See this. Can you say end diastolic aortic pressure? So this is the baseline, but what is happening is you are going below the baseline. So this is the assistance of end diastolic pressure. So the end diastolic pressure is going below the baseline. So both phases of the diastole, you get benefit. You get not just benefit in the diastolic augmentation, where it improves the coronary circulation, improves the cerebral circulation, and beyond the balloon, it improves the circulation in the art, renal artery and the legs. But most importantly, it also reduces the uh, end diastolic pressure. So when the end diastolic pressure in the aorta reduces, the heart has to work less to achieve the same amount of uh, ejection fraction. Can you see that? So this benefit, this extra thing, the heart is having to work less. So this is an assisted systolic pressure. But look, now because you have gone down here, you don't have to work as hard to achieve the same amount of pressure increase. Okay? So the amount of ejection pressure goes down but the volume remains the same. Did you understand that? So this is the understanding of, of uh, balloon pump. That is why most people draw this and they stop. Okay, whenever in the exam I've asked people to draw balloon pump, most people draw this normal and they draw this augmentation and stop. And I'm sure today a lot of you did that. You just drew this augmentation for me and stopped. But that is not where the balloon pump stops. The balloon pump benefit continues into diastole and you have to draw the next cycle where there is reduction, severe reduction in the end diastolic pressure in the aorta. Okay, so this pressure has gone down. This is the baseline in the previous cycle. Look, it's gone down. And then the next cycle also has to be drawn where you have to show that the myocardium has to work less to get the same amount of pressure. So this peak has to come down, okay? So the assisted systolic pressure in the peak following the balloon is always less. So myocardial oxygen consumption is less, and then you come back to base, okay? Did you understand that? So this is very, very, very important that don't just draw one peak and show me one peak. That is not the point. The point is you have to continue and show me this benefit in end diastole. And more importantly, you have to show me the benefit in end, in, syst in the next systole. Because in the next, syst next systole, you don't have to work as hard to get the same aortic pressure. Did this make sense, guys, or no? Anybody's got any questions to ask? I'm, I'm quite happy to stop. This is once in a lifetime chance to learn this very, very well. Okay? Yes or no? One person keep mic on and just tell me if you've understood or not understood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have you understood? Yes. That it yes, is never understood. one tracing. It is you have to draw the second and the third tracing also. That is a normal balloon pump tracing, not just the one tracing. Or if you draw just one cycle with one little augmentation, that's not good enough because that's not telling me that you've understood the real benefit of a balloon pump. You got to continue on to the next tracing and show me that the systole has gone down, the work of myocardium on systole has gone down. That is why I explained it before I showed you the tracing. Yeah? Okay. Now, show me an ECG trigger on the balloon pump. Draw me the same, just draw me the second part of the 
of that previous graph. This second part, just draw me, but on the top of this, draw me an ECG and show me what is the ECG trigger for the balloon pump because balloon pump works on ECG trigger. So yesterday I showed you an ECG, where is the depolarization of the myocardium happening? What is the start of diastole on the ECG? So now draw me just the middle part, but show me the ECG trigger for the balloon pump because balloon pump, the best, only way it senses when to inflate and when to deflate is on the basis of an ECG. Is it making sense? Yes, sir. Okay, draw me the trigger of the ECG. Whenever you are ready, I'm happy to go to the next one. So draw the dichrotic notch. Show me the ejection after the inflation of the balloon pump. But on top of it, I want you to show me what is happening on the ECG because the balloon is always triggered according to the ECG. Hey, somebody switch off your... Uh... Show me the ECG trigger for a balloon pump. Very important. PQRST. And then the next PQRST, but what lies on that augmentation phase? So what triggers the inflation and what triggers the deflation? on the basis of a cardiac cycle I want to know. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yeah, Vikas happy? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the picture of the ECG trigger, okay? So always remember you on the ECG, you need to know what is diastole, okay? And so this T wave, the peak of T wave, the midpoint of the T wave is the one that the balloon is sensory. Okay, so the augmented augmentation, the diacrotic notch always is at the peak of, uh, at the middle of the T wave. So the balloon pump is sensing for T waves. And when you get a T wave, that's when the balloon blows the helium into the balloon and causes the augmentation. Then you have the next cycle and you've got the P, you got the Q, and then you got the R, the peak of R wave. It is always the peak of R wave which triggers the deflation, okay? You may not understand it straight away. Take your time, it's okay. Keep it with you and go back. But remember in an exam, when I ask you on an ECG, what is the trigger point for the balloon inflation? It is the midpoint of the T wave or the peak of T wave. And what is the trigger point for deflation? It is always the peak of R wave that triggers the deflation of the balloon pump. And whenever you physically adjust, because you have controls on the balloon pump, okay? Because if there's arrhythmia and things like that, then you can physically trigger the, uh, the arrangement and you can adjust your balloon pump in such a way. There, there are setting controls and you can adjust it. So you have to set it so that the balloon pump picks the, in the, the inflation of the balloon pump down here, the blue one, starts at the middle of the T wave and the deflation which is happening here after the plateau is correlated to the peak of R wave. That is a correct example of proper selection of balloon inflation and deflation. Is it making sense now? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is it. Uh, <clears throat> So this is the second, the benefit of balloon pump, the second benefit that this decrease in aortic pressure means that the left ventricle needs to generate less pressure 
to open the aortic valve. See, this diagram is self-explanatory. Thus, the afterload is reduced. That's the other answer. The afterload is reduced. As the balloon deflates, the aortic pressure decreases. Yeah, so this deflation is important. So that was the second understanding. Again, this is just an understanding of the pressure of the balloon tracing. So always when the balloon triggers, it's the middle of the T wave. And it usually overinflates, overshoots, and then plateaus down. The plateau is at maximum inflation. So if you read the pressures within the balloon, you will find that it suddenly jerks up, but then plateaus out. And this is the maximum amount of helium which is flowing into the balloon. And then the balloon deflates. And whenever you look at it, it's the physics of the thing that whenever it deflates, there is always an overshoot of deflation. And then it uh, levels out. The other thing you need to remember is that the baseline filling pressure is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury in a balloon pump. So sometimes if you're asked to draw just the tracing of the balloon pump, this is the tracing of the balloon pump. Always remember over inflation. Don't forget over deflation. But the latent period is important. And the latent period can be maintained as a flat line. Okay. So this is the understanding of inflation, deflation and ECG triggered tracing of a balloon pump. Okay? All right. Show me what's going to happen in an early inflation of a balloon pump. What happens if your balloon is not triggered properly and it is causing early inflation of the balloon? Which means that the balloon is inflating in systole, late systole. Is that okay or is that a problem? That is counterproductive. Just quickly draw me a diagram of what happens if the balloon is triggering early. So early inflation of balloon pump. Are you guys drawing or not drawing? Drawing. What do you think will happen? And is it okay to have an early inflation of balloon pump? Anybody can take this question. Anybody wants to take the question? In late systole, the balloon pump is inflated. What is going to happen? Uh, to the work of the heart. How? Uh, so as if the, the heart is supposed to be pumping forward and if yeah. the balloon inflates, it will push the back uh, blood back towards the heart. So the heart, the end... What will happen to the aortic valve? So the uh, valve will remain open. Early closure of aortic valve. Early closure of aortic valve. You're absolutely right. Early closure of aortic valve. Because aortic valve closure depends on the atrial pressure. Yeah? So there will be early closure of aortic valve. What will happen to the cardiac output? Cardiac output is going to reduce. Good. Excellent. Very good. So this is the answer to it. Okay. So if you move this aortic inflation deflation early in the aortic cycle, somewhere here mid systole or late systole, then the aortic valve is closed prematurely because the pressure in the aorta will suddenly go up. When the pressure in the aorta goes up, the back pressure will cause the aortic valve to close prematurely. Systole will end prematurely and the LV will be incompletely ejected. So one is the cardiac output will go down, but in the next cycle, the heart is already full and more blood is coming on. So in a failing myocardium, you're increasing the workload of the, of the, of the ventricle. So that is very, very bad. If you inflate a balloon pump early in a failing myocardium, very rapidly the patient will go downhill because here you are trying to increase cardiac output, but early inflation will decrease the cardiac output by causing early closure of the aortic valve and early end of systole. So the next systole will suffer. The subsequent systoles will suffer. So it is very, very important to time the aortic, uh, to time the balloon pump correctly so that 
the heart does not struggle, okay? So there is increased left ventricular oxygen demand because the afterload is increased, okay? There is decreased LV oxygen supply because the diastolic perfusion has gone down. So the coronaries have not perfused well and you have closed, you have inflated the balloon. Very, very bad situation. So one, you are increasing the LV oxygen demand and you're decreasing the oxygen supply by decreasing the amount of blood which will go into the coronary arteries. Thereby, in the next cycle, the cardiac output will go down because the stroke volume has gone down, okay? So this is a very, very, very bad thing to do. Never ever inflate a balloon pump early in a, uh, in a sick patient, okay? These are the three things that you have to remember. Oxygen demand goes up, oxygen supply goes down. Both of them are not good for a failing myocardium, which is already struggling. So the cardiac output will go down and the stroke volume will go down as well, okay? All right, now draw me a diagram of late balloon inflation and tell me what is going to happen to it when there is late balloon inflation. Is there a problem if you inflate it too late? Yeah, so this is the diagram. So what is the problem if you deflate it too late? Anybody wants to tell me? Coronary perfusion will suffer. We will not yeah. be able to augment the coronary So the benefit of the balloon is lost if you deflate it, inflate it too late. The diastolic augmentation which you were expecting to get in a normal eye, if you see the normal tracing, look up here, this is the normal tracing. But when you deflate it too, if you inflate it too late in the cycle, the diastolic augmentation is hardly anything. You've lost this diastolic augmentation. The moment you lose the diastolic augmentation, what is lost? Coronary perfusion is lost. The benefit of increasing coronary perfusion is lost. So this is the answer. Whenever balloon is inflated too late in the cycle, the diastolic augmentation is lost and because diastolic augmentation is lost, coronary perfusion does not go up. You are here trying to increase the coronary perfusion. See this, this is a late inflation and see this, this is normal inflation. So this difference is not achieved. Can you see this? It's a huge difference. And this is the whole reason why you're using the balloon pump. And if you don't time it right, you are doing more damage to the patient, not less damage. So there is more damage to the patient and the myocardium, which is already struggling, will quickly give up and you will lose the benefit of a balloon pump, okay? So whenever a sick patient on a balloon pump starts to deteriorate, a sick patient on a balloon pump starts to deteriorate, the first thing you have to look at is the timing of the balloon pump. Is the balloon pump timing itself correctly on the patient or not because even if you inflate early or you inflate late both of them are detrimental to the benefit of the patient so it is very important the first thing when i somebody calls me and says the patient's blood pressure is falling the cardiac output and index is falling in spite of having put in a balloon pump the first thing i do is i go to the balloon pump and i study the trace and i study the ecg I look at the ECG, I study the trace, and I want to time the ECG, not, uh, I want to time the inflation, not on the basis of the aortic tracing, but on the basis of ECG. So I'm always looking for the ECG when I'm timing the balloon pump. So you cannot time, you know, it's not easy to time it to the diacrotic notch, but it's easy to time it to the T wave, the peak of the T wave. So always you have to manipulate. The question that will ask you, as I said, is, what do you do? You should say, I will go to the balloon pump and I will look at the timing of the balloon pump. There's something wrong with the timing of the balloon pump. And I want to make sure that it is not inflating too early. And I want to make sure it is not inflating too late. So it should not be after the diacrotic knot. 
and should not be before the diacrotic notch. It should be at the diacrotic diacrotic notch. Is it making sense? Everybody, is it making sense or is it getting more yes, complicated? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. The next question is what is going to happen when there is early balloon? Uh, sorry, this is late balloon inflation. So diastolic augmentation is lost and the coronary perfusion is lost. Okay. So these are the two problems of late balloon inflation. Yeah. Now tell me what, draw me a, oh God, I forgot to do this. Okay. So this is a diagram for early balloon deflation. So now explain to me what will happen in an early balloon deflation. What is it? I, I forgot to animate this slide. I'm sorry about that. So if you deflate it before the peak of R wave, what is the problem? Can somebody tell me? The advantage of falling uh, arctic pressure which we were getting, we will not get. Absolutely. The end diastolic pressure returns to its unassisted level. So if you deflate the balloon, balloon early, then this end diastolic pressure decrease of the aortic pressure is not achieved. You see in the previous one, the end diastolic pressure was here. But here it is back to the same level as the previous one. Can you see that? So the assisted heart really receives no assistance at all. You are managing to push more blood into the coronary. No doubt about it. So you... You're, when you inflate it, you're definitely pushing more blood into the coronary circulation. You're definitely putting more blood into the cerebral circulation. But the advantage of the aortic end diastolic pressure, the increase myocardial oxygenation and the decrease in the end diastolic pressure is not achieved. So the heart is receiving no benefit whatsoever. So the deflation is also not a good thing. If you deflate too early, then that's not good for the patient, okay? So early deflation fails to improve the left ventricular afterload and thereby fails to decrease the left ventricular oxygen demand. The left ventricle is not assisted in opening the aortic valve because obviously the aortic pressure has gone up, not down. We wanted the aortic pressure to go down in the next systole, but it has not gone down. So the poor left ventricle is again having to work hard on isovolumetric contraction to open the aortic valve because the pressure on the other side is higher. So there is no afterload reduction when the balloon deflates early. Did you understand that? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, now draw me a diagram of late balloon deflation. So there are four diagrams, early inflation, late inflation. The next diagram is early deflation and late deflation. Show me what happens in a late deflation. Is there any problem or there is no problem? Also draw the aortic IABP uh, tracing as well, below the aortic tracing. So don't forget to draw the IABP tracing. Done. Okay, so this is the diagram for a late balloon deflation. The problem with late balloon deflation is that you are now impinging into the next systole. Okay, you are not ending it before systole. So when you deflate a balloon too late, you are impinging into the next systole. When you impinge into the next, next systole, what you're doing is you're increasing the pressure in the aorta. 
the moment you increase the pressure in the aorta the poor myocardium has to work very hard to overcome the increased pressure in the so the myocardium is contracting but the the balloon has not yet deflated and the pressure is so high in the aorta that it is really having to work hard to push open that aortic valve so again a failing myocardium if you deflate the balloon too late you are going to make the myocardium work harder so your end aortic end diastolic pressure will go up see this so this tracing which is supposed to be down here because you are supposed to do an end diastolic decrease in the pressure now has unfortunately gone up here see this is the baseline tracing and so this baseline tracing this tracing has gone up it is actually harder for the next systole so if you deflate it too much too late then your end diastolic pressure is gone up and unfortunately you are impinged into the next systole and that's not good and continue that over a few cycles and the myocardium will suddenly give up and say i can't work against this balloon so you are doing more damage to the patient when you are doing a late deflation so the late deflation could be because of a kink in the catheter but the problem is it increases end diastolic pressure and it increases the afterload as a result of which the left ventricular oxygen consumption increases did this make sense this is the basic understanding of a balloon pump and the tracings of a balloon pump did you did you understand balloon pump or not yes or no guys or any confusion hello no answer yes yes understood we are writing it down that's why it's taking time you don't need to worry about writing it down this is all being recorded so this will all go out okay all right so now i'm going to quickly talk a few slides on ventricular assist device this is not a lecture on ventricular assist device please i'm not going to show you any diagram or anything like that i just want to show you a comparison of balloon pump versus vags okay so let's quickly few things about uh, the indication contraindications and then just the uh, lvad versus balloon pump the indication and contraindication so when so i'm just going to go through these slides there are no questions here okay so the ventricular assist device is indicated in cardiogenic shock in cardiac arrest in fulminant myocarditis in and in failure to wean on bypass okay it can be standby for high risk ptca and can be on standby for high risk cardiac surgery with poor pre operative function the contraindications to a ventricular assist device are the same like a balloon pump so aortic regurgitation aortic aneurysm or dissection a thrombus in the left heart uncontrolled bleeding or uncontrolled sepsis so more or less the same the ventricular assist devices are either available as an axial uh, pump which is an archimedes screw or a centrifugal pump the flow is non pulsatile which results in poor end organ function the action of a pumping blood in this way provokes hemolysis the insertion usually requires a sternotomy and it may be implanted for up to a month but you can't walk around with it in uh, but the newer models you can actually they are portable and they are uh, th there are some newer models which are available but again this is not a talk on vag so please don't uh, expect me to go into the details heparin is the choice of drug and aptt is monitored to keep it under control uh, these are the complications of a <coughs> ventricular assist device infection arrhythmias thrombi hemolysis and thrombocytopenia these are all self explanatory for me this is the important thing that's why i bought these few slides in is look at this okay this picture please take a shot of this and this is the the comparison of balloon pump versus uh, lv devices so there are indications uh, the logistics the anticoagulation needed and the complications this is by far the best graph i have found which actually gives you a direct comparison of a versus b so take this slide and keep it with you and go through it uh, later on and 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 try to understand it okay so this is all very very nicely put out the same things that i told on the slide are now completely in front of you where iabp and vad are compared with indications uh, these are the contraindications of iabp versus vad uh, ventricular assist devices uh these are the advantages of iabp very very clearly laid out 
pet side and things like that. So just go through this slide. I'll, I'll leave it up there for you on our, uh, on our, this is all the written part, which I showed on my slides is directly from these uh, written, uh, from these graphs. And these are the disadvantages of IABP versus balloon uh, pump. And then the anticoagulation that is required and the complications that you get IABP versus VAD. So this is actually a summary of all my previous slides in a chart form. Okay, so I've put it up as a chart for you to understand all the things. Uh, and, and very often in the exam, we ask you, what is the benefit? What is the complication? What is the difference between a LVAD or a RVAD versus IABP? Okay, one last graph I'm going to do. It is six o'clock exactly. So anybody, actually Vikas, you take over this, um, this, and I want you to actually explain, I want everybody to draw this, okay? So draw me uh, the heart sounds in, first draw the normal heart sound in relation to diastole, systole, diastole, systole, and then draw me aortic stenosis, draw me mitral regurgitation, draw me aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. And if you want, you can also draw PDA. Because do you want to take over this uh, slide? I don't mind you taking over this slide. Okay, I'll, I'll put up the pictures and you can take over the slide. Because you just did the talk on aortic and mitral stenosis. So it'd be perfect for you to explain this next uh, picture which I put up. But first everybody draw because this is something that is asked in the exam. So draw a vertical line and draw diastole, then draw another vertical line, and draw systole, then draw another diastole and systole, and give me the sounds. Where is the first and the second heart sound? I want to know the first and the second heart sound. This is my last slide for, for this talk, and then we'll go back to ECG. And Vikas, you can take over the explanation of this, this because you did such a yes, sir. beautiful job when you explained this. Whenever you have drawn it, please tell me you have drawn it. So I want to know normal. Then second one I want to know is aortic stenosis. The third one is mitral regurgitation. The fourth one is aortic regurgitation. And the fifth one is mitral stenosis. And if you want, you can also draw PDA. But these are the common ones that are asked in the exam. Yes or no? Okay, there is the answer. Because take over and explain all of them for them. Okay, so first, first A is the uh, uh, normal heart sound. So first heart sound is uh, uh, due to closure of the uh, the uh, the mitral and tricuspid valves, so uh, this is a high pitch sound, and then second heart sound is due to closure of the pulmonary and aortic valves. So in aortic stenosis, uh, we have a diamond shaped uh, high pitch. This is one of the highest pitch murmurs which we find in uh, in in cardiac with uh, cardiac pathology. So this is a diamond shaped murmur. It, it is typically called called a crescendo crescendo decrescendo murmur. So so, uh, second second diagram is the uh, uh, murmur of the aortic stenosis. Uh, in mitral regurgitation, we have a pan-systolic pan -systolic murmur. So, uh, this murmur is a low pitch murmur and it is best heard at the apex. So, in mitral, uh, mitral uh, regurgitation, the first heart sound is uh, actually bo both the heart sounds are basically um, uh, overshadowed by the murmur. So that's why we are not seeing that first heart sound and second sound. Uh, sound that, I think the first heart sound is uh, uh, submerged in the murmur. Then aortic regurgitation, 
the first heart sound uh, first heart sound will be normal and we'll have a decreased diastolic murmur uh, so this murmur is the uh, highest in intensity highest in intensity at intensity at the starting and it decreases as the diastolic progresses so we have to that that is shown that the volume of murmur is higher in the initial stage the mitral stenosis is a typical murmur which is a uh, late diastolic murmur and there are two three things in mitral stenosis murmur which we have seen so here uh, unless the uh, uh, mitral valve is very calcified the first heart sound will be uh, first heart sound will be louder so that first heart sound we have to draw louder and then uh, the murmur is late diastolic murmur with pre systolic accentuation in the heart heart sounds we have and there's the opening snap this opening snap is because of the billowing of the uh, leaflets of the mitral valve and uh, why we have a pre systolic accentuation because if the patient is not in atrial fibrillation the third third uh, there are three phases in the diastole the rapid ventricular filling phase then uh, phase of diastasis and then proto diastole so in the proto diastole that is the time when the left atrium is contracting and it is ejecting extra blood into the uh, ventricle so that is the time we have pre systolic accentuation so this pre systolic accentuation will not be there if the patient is having uh legal uh, is patient is having either mitral regurgitation or atrial fibrillation then go slow, fourth, go slow because go slow you're doing really well yes, sir. just go slow because okay. people are trying to understand they're looking at the picture and trying to understand what you're saying so so, so in mitral stenosis yeah. in mitral stenosis uh, unless there uh, the leaflets of the valve is calcified we'll have the loud first heart sound and the murmur is late diastolic murmur so uh, and there is opening snap this opening snap is because of billowing of the mitral valve leaflets when the leaflets are opening that time because of uh, stenosis there's a uh, effect like when we pull the strings of the kite it gets taut so when the leaflet the cordae are getting taut that time we get the opening snap then there is pre systolic accentuation because there are three phases of diastole the rapid ventricular filling phase then diastasis and proto diastole in proto diastole that is the time when left atrium is contracting and filling the left ventricle so that time we some extra blood is getting pushed that is 30, almost 15 to 30 percent of the uh, cardiac output uh, so that is why we have uh, pre 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 systolic accentuation and last one is patent ductus arteriosus this is a machinery murmur because the uh, the pressure in aorta is high and pressure in the pulmonary artery is very low so it the flow is both in the uh, diastole and systole so that is why both the heart sounds we can see they are buried in the machinery murmur so this is also one of the loudest murmur and most of the time it will be associated with this excellent excellent did everybody understand this is very very self explanatory but uh, because he just did the topic and he showed these graphs in his talk and i'm sure he's going to show these graphs in the in this week he's going to do mitral uh, stenosis so he's going to show us the same thing it's very important this picture you must 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 practice again and again okay once you understand this picture very clearly then there is no question about uh, the long case absolutely no question about your long case it's very easy once you have understood this picture most people struggle because they don't have this picture in their mind so it's all very very beautifully explained you know crescendo decrescendo showing the timing of the murmur where exactly it's happening as long as you can tell me first and second heart sound i'm very happy with that that is all i want to hear and i want to hear the description of the murmur that's all i want okay and if you can time the murmur and show me the description of the murmur you will you will pass your exams then after that the discussion is on to other things management and all is is for extra marks but for passing you need to be able to identify the murmur and describe the murmur to me because once you identify the murmur correctly then your diagnosis in the long case will become very very clear okay and then the management does not fail you you never ever fail on a management you will usually fail because you forgot you did not identify the murmur correctly okay so very important up to the point of the murmur the moment you have said the murmur is correct we know you are going to come up with the correct diagnosis we have passed you in the exam and then you go on to the next phase everything else is for extra marks okay so now i'm going to stop here i won't do the graphs in pulmonology now uh, i want to actually stop sharing this for a minute uh, because give me back the control let me take back the control uh, and um, i'm going to stop